Okay. So, I'm going to uh, introduce some folks. We have Luke, Janet, Melissa, and Majed. And uh, you'll see all those guys up at the top. Um, and they are joining us today um, to run this uh, collaborative meeting with um, libraries across the country and the United States Department of Agriculture's Food and Nutrition Service. Um, my name is Penny Weaver. I work for the USDA's Food and Nutrition Service Office of Public Affairs. I'm located in Chicago. And uh, I'm really happy to be here to talk to, uh, to you guys, potential um, summer meal service uh, sites. And there's potentially some folks out there that have already worked with SFSP, and we'll talk a little bit about how summer meals is a little bit different here in 2020. So um, without I, our agenda today, uh, we just did some introductions. Uh, my colleague, Majed Hanafi, is uh, the team lead um, in our child nutrition or community nutrition division here in Chicago. He is a technical expert, although we probably won't get into too many technical details today. Uh, he is here in the event that uh, you have some questions uh, for him. And then also Luke will be presenting about the collaborative summer learning program. And then afterwards, we'll take some question and answer. All right, so let's start with the important details. <laughs> right, what is the summer food service program? So the Summer Food Service Program was actually established to ensure that low-income children continue to receive the nutritious meals uh, when school is not in session. All right, so the program is federally funded, federal employee here, um, and uh, USDA actually contracts with state agencies like the Department of Education to administer the program. Uh, USDA reimburses the sponsors who provide nutritious meals to children that are ages 18 and younger. Uh, all of the meals that are served actually have to meet federal nutrition guidelines. And to be served, all those meals have to actually be served at approved summer sites in areas with a significant concentration of low-income children. So today, I'm actually going to toss around a few different terms um, that we kind of use interchangeably for the Summer Food Service Program. So we are a federal agency, and we like our acronyms, so that's where the SFSP comes from. And so you'll hear me say SFSP, Summer Food Service Program. You'll also hear summer meals a lot, and summer meals is tossed around. Now, but wait, there's even more. So each state actually likes to use their own terms. So you might see in different propaganda or websites or whatever around the country, you might see things like read up and eat up or meet up and eat up or lunch at the library or different things like that. So just know that Summer Food Service has a lot of different names. So today, um, I'm going to go over a few different things, the who, the what, the where, the when, and how um, SFSP runs. So the SFSP operates during summer school vacations, primarily in the summer months. That's May through September. Or, <laughs> and or is important here, um, during unanticipated school closures from October to April. All right. Remember the or. So who does the Summer Food Service serve? Children and teens that are age 18 and younger. So if you have a, a high school graduate that's 18, um, already graduated, that's fine. They're 18 and younger, they can still eat, all right? And any kiddo that's not even in school yet, but in like a you know, childcare age, they can eat uh, these program, in this program as well. So let's talk about the where, all right? We want to feed kids where there is a need, okay? Um, area eligibility is a term that you'll learn as you um, get involved in the program. Um, area eligibility, normally, 
and still is, uh, based on whether the local school district has 50% of the kids participating in the free and reduced school meal program. So we call that like a 50% area, all right? So you're gonna hear that term a bunch. Um, this year is a tad different. Some of the areas that haven't qualified in years past might actually qualify this year. Um, there uh, is a mapping tool that I'm gonna show you here in a couple of minutes. Our state partners and our sponsor partners at the, at the local area can actually help you uh, determine if your library is in a location that qualifies. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how it works. Since right now I've tossed out a couple different partners that work with the, work with the program. So I'm at the USDA. The USDA Food and Nutrition Service actually has seven regional offices across uh, the United States and then a headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, we administer the SFSP at the national level. We actually contract with the state to administer the program. So in California, the program is administered by the California Department of Education. Um, in Virginia, the program is administered by the Virginia Department of Health. Um, in Arizona, it's uh, the Department of Education. So it's gonna be a little bit different in each state. We do have a location for you to find who your state partner will be on our website, and we'll share that in a minute. So locally, um, the public and private nonprofit organizations that want to sponsor the program, they apply, and then they're approved by the state agency to operate the program. These sponsoring organizations, actually, they sign a program agreement with uh, the state agency. So, um, I'd be a YMCA who's uh, the sponsor, and then they're going to uh, sign an agreement with the state agency who's the Department of Education. Now, the sponsoring agency or the sponsor is actually responsible for overseeing all of the program operations. They prepare and deliver the meals to the site, they conduct compliance reviews, et cetera. They're the ones who have to get deep into the federal regulation. All right? Um, so at the end of the summer, the sponsors receive a federal reimbursement from the state, comes from us through the state, your tax dollars all the way down, um, and that covers the administrative and the operating costs of actually preparing and serving the meals to the kids. Oftentimes, the sponsor will run more than uh, one feeding site. They might have 20 in one area. So let's talk about what a site is. So the site is where, uh, is the physical location where the meal is served, um, and the sponsor typically prepares the food and takes it to the site, and then the site folks um, provide this food service to the children. And um, up until this summer, <laughs> um, following the federal regulations, a location uh, where the children consume the meals is a, a supervised congregate setting. So we asked if the kids were in one place, had an enrichment activity, they ate the meals, they didn't take the food off of the site. Off the site. So a good thing to note here is that um, the site doesn't typically make their own meals. So a library, I realize you guys aren't a food, our food people, your book people, and education people. So this is a good thing to note right here that you serve the meal as opposed to preparing the meal. All right. Libraries make great sites. And as you guys know, um, libraries have a long history of being open to everyone. Um, they have long hours. Um, you guys have really great programming, and there are some really awesome people that run them. <laughs> so this summer, 2020, isn't like any other summer. We're seeing a record number of unemployment and families that are struggling to feed their children. And right now, we're actually looking for safe and trusted locations to serve those meals. And the library 
is a safe and trusted location and a perfect community location to serve those meals. Let's talk about um, summer 2020. So I made reference to the fact that <clears throat> SFSP is a federal program it's administered under the federal regulations. Uh, many of those regs have actually been waived this summer. <clears throat> We're seeing that there's some flexibilities that might actually be appealing to libraries this year. So maybe you've thought about SFSP in the past. Um, this year's a little bit different. Also know that if you run SFSP this summer, it could look different next year because we might not have the same waivers in place next year that we have this year. So just know that kind of going in. But this is how this year is going to go. Um, some of the flexibilities are these. The children don't necessarily have to congregate to eat the food, and that's what they've had to typically do in the past. Um, right now, it's, it's okay to uh, hand out a meal and they can take it away. That's all right. Parents can actually pick up the meals for the kids. Very, very different. Usually the child had to be present in order to do that. And we suggest that you guys all follow CDC guidelines or talk to your local health authority and figure out what kind of safety measures we might have to put in place at uh, their summer site. So changes to the food requirements are actually a little bit different too. Um, talk to the sponsor. Uh, again, you probably don't have to prepare the meals, but it's just that's a little bit different. I wanted to point that out. Um, in some cases, like I said earlier, um, the areas that qualified uh, or that didn't qualify in the past will actually qualify this year. Again, the sponsor and the state agency can certainly help you determine whether you're in a qualifying area. Um, some of the details that uh, you might not need to worry about um, as a site are actually left up to uh, the sponsors because, like I said, they do a lot of the meal prep and they can, they can worry about this stuff. The summer is just different. It's just different. Okay. so. I have a couple examples of where uh, summer food, summer meals um, have been served at library. And uh, remember earlier, I said that summer meals right now is happening in times in between October and April, right? So the unanticipated closure. So in Iowa, over the last few months, libraries have actually stepped it up. Um, with uh, a start of the unanticipated school closures, about 18 of the libraries um, served as distribution locations for grab-and-go meals, um, predominantly in some of the rural communities across the state. Now, last year in 2019, there were 17 libraries that, that operated the, the, the regular summer meal site, but these folks these other libraries actually stepped up during the unanticipated time and, um, and served as grab-and-go sites. So of the 18, 17 of them had never even participated in summer meals. And so that's super cool, and we're really excited that you guys stepped up and helped us out there. Um, some of the 18 uh, will actually continue operating through June 30th, um, but some of them are actually going to end in May. So that was what they could commit to. That's what they wanted to commit to. Maybe their libraries aren't going to be open. Maybe they don't have the uh, capability to do it. That's fine. They stepped it up. We needed them and, and they did their service. So thank you. Um, so going on into the regular summer season, eight of those uh, additional new libraries are actually going to start providing meals and snacks, which is awesome. They're going to be summer sites. They're going to continue to do that. So with this, about 26 libraries in Iowa will have participated in 2020. So either it's because of the unanticipated closures or because uh, they're going to serve in the, the regular season or both. And that's really, really an amazing thing. And I'm very excited to share that example with you. So uh, in St. Louis County, Missouri, another good example, um, that library system actually partnered with uh, Food Search. 
um, and Food Search is a, a nonprofit, and they helped them. Uh, they prepared meals, and then nine of the libraries in that uh, county actually did a drive-through grab-and-go for families. Again, really cool, kind of more of an urban area. We're very excited um, that they participated. I don't know um, how they're going to how that's going to flow in the next couple of months, but up until now. Kudos to you guys. Thank you for participating. So let's talk about who the sponsors are. Um, the sponsors are like the, the YMCA or the Parks Department or the local schools, um, maybe a food bank. Um, the sponsor, uh, like I mentioned earlier, was actually responsible for all the administrative pieces of the program. The training, uh, the monitoring, the finances, meal prep, um, and then delivery in some cases. Uh, so while libraries might be uh, eligible to act as both a sponsor and a site, it is recommended that libraries become acquainted with the program by acting as a summer site in their first year. Okay. So how do you find a sponsor? How are you going to do the matchmaking? Uh, we have a couple tools that can help you do that. Um, you can use any of the tools here. Um, there's a uh, mapping tool with a link that you will also find in the chat, and I will try to display for you here in a minute. We have a 800 number that you can call, and you're going to actually find a summer uh, sponsor or some of the sites that are already, um, already exist. Maybe you guys don't become a site this year. Maybe this isn't your thing, but you can spread the word. And by spreading the word, I mean, you can give people this 800 number. You can give people the texting information that's down below. You can create a bookmark that has this information on it um, and spread the word for us so that the families can find a site that's in uh, your area. So again, you don't have to be a sponsor. You don't have to be a site. But if you can spread the word, that'd be awesome. Let the kids, let the families know that there are free meal sites in their community. Right. And then the other way um, that you can uh, link up is to actually contact your state. And I will show you, there's a link here. We're going to put the link in the chat and then I'll show you um, here. I'll share my screen. I'll show you the site. Uh, the states can actually do some of that matchmaking for you. So maybe you don't go out and you find a local sponsor, but they can t determine um, who they are. The state also knows whether or not the sponsor is in good standing, and they also know if the sponsor is, has the capacity to actually take on another site. Because you could call the sponsor and the sponsor's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we can take you. But then the state might say, you know what? They already have 30 sites. Maybe you shouldn't be working with them. So it depends upon you know, who you want to reach out to. Okay. So I wanted to show you our mapping tool. So be patient with me here as I move through our technology. I'm going to share my screen. That is monitor two. All right, can you see my screen? Thanks for the thumbs up, Melissa. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right, so I wanted to show you that this is our landing page for the Feed and Nutrition Service. We've got all kinds of really great details in here. If you scroll down, you will find how you can participate. Say this summer is the summer you're gonna become a site. You're interested in operating a site. Well, then you would click here and it'll take you off to how you can actually become a sponsor, how you can become a site, um, how you qualify, if you need to prepare meals, if you need to apply to actually be a sponsor, all of those details are there. Oops. And all right, so say you need to contact the state, you click on um, Contact the state, which is on that very first page again. You can scroll through. You can figure out 
you know, uh, which state you live in and actually go and find that state and it'll tell you exactly who you need to contact and it'll send you to their website. Um, it'll even give you more information about other programs that they run, not just summer food service. So maybe summer food service isn't for you, but in the fall, you want to serve a snack, we can hook you up, all right? So other options out there. Now, when you go back over to this front page, you can also figure out how to find a summer site. So remember, you can use this tool to not only figure out if you qualify, but also to find other summer sites and promote where those other summer sites are in your area. So if you click on this, and again, the link is in the chat, click on this and it takes you off to what we call our uh, capacity builder, but I, or meals to kids, I don't know, it's been changing over the years, but it's interactive and this is kind of neat. So in here, um, in here, you click on this, the map. Give it a second, be patient. Maybe this is where you sing happy birthday two times. I don't know, we're all used to doing that right now. Okay, as this opens up, on the right-hand side, um, you uh, type in a zip code. Let's say I used to live in Charlestown, Massachusetts. That's 02129, Charlestown, Massachusetts. And then it thinks a little bit and it's like, okay, and what it's telling me is <clears throat> the state agency has provided us all of the details of the approved sites for this summer. Excuse me, I haven't talked this much in a while. Um, all right. So what we're seeing here is that all of these blue little dots are summer feeding sites that are already approved that already exist. If you click on the dot itself, a nice little window pops up. And this might be kind of small for you guys to see, so I'll just kind of tell you what's happening. What it's telling me here is that Charlestown High School is a summer meal site. You can get breakfast and you can get lunch there. And it tells me when the meals are being served. It also tells me the days of operation. So I know that summer site that this summer site is serving breakfast and lunch Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So they're not open on Saturday and Sunday. But anybody that you can serve any, any, any day of the week, it's just that these guys only serve, they've only committed to serving this many days. The other thing that I'm learning here, and it's important for you to know, is that the sponsoring organization or the sponsor is Boston Public Schools or Boston School Committee. So, um, this is how you can find a sponsor, and this is how you can find some of the um, uh, some of the sites that are in your area. If you click on Zoom, it takes you all the way down, and also tells you that um, so you can see specifically like where you are. There's some filters that you can learn uh, that you can use, and there's one in here that for some reason is not appearing, but um, it, it will appear, it should appear, um, and it'll tell you exactly whether or not your area is 50% or not. Um, it's been a while since I've been in here and fiddled with it. If you click on some of those filters, you can f figure out like whether the area qualifies or where the local housing authority is or, um, or there's a handful of things where the local churches is. You guys might already be located on there. Um, and if you're not, you can always send us some data and we can add you in. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and head back over here. So now I've showed you the mapping tool. A couple more resources. If you go to our Summer Food website, you can learn about um, uh, some good examples about some programs that are running across the country. You can figure out uh, how, uh, who the state agency is that you need to talk to. And there's also some fun promotional materials that are already designed that you guys can print out and use. And uh, I wanna thank you very much for, for having me today. Uh, we look forward to uh, either you guys participating in summer meals or for you guys at least 
spread the word that, um, that the summer meal sites do exist in your community. Um, I appreciate all the work that you guys do. I'm going to wrap it up right now uh, and then hand it over to Luke and uh, we'll take some Q&A um, if, if it's needed uh, at the end. So thank you very much. I'm going to uh, move into your slides, Luke, and then hand you the ball of power. All right. So you should be able to flip your slides now. All right. Well, well thank you, Penny. That was super great and a lot of good information there. And I'm going to just spend a little bit of time today because I do want to make sure that we've got plenty of time for questions. Um, but I did want to kind of give just a, a little quick overview of CSLP um, and a little bit of some of the things that we're doing to kind of help facilitate uh, summer food sites and also just to kind of share a, a few resources for uh, that, that libraries can kind of leverage in this very unusual summer that we, we all find ourselves in. Um, so I'm going to hopefully advance my slides. <laughs> Yay! Um, so I just want, you know, so what is CSLP? So I just wanted to share our mission. Um, you know, we empower libraries to foster community, and we do that through summer programming. Um, we feel that summer programming should be empowering for libraries, but it also should be sort of those tools that they help uh, empower and, and connect with their community. Um, so uh, our mission is to empower libraries to foster community. And our vision is, is, is sort of the, the mechanism that we use to kind of help help bolster that, um, you know, specifically just by providing that unified theme um, and professional support. I think that's one of the real strengths of our program is that we have a lot of folks participating, kind of working within the same kind of framework and toolkit across the country. And, and we're really stronger by working together, being able to share those ideas, being able to see what other folks are doing and, and just kind of leverage those things. Um, so, so how do we make that happen? <laughs> and I've like normally I don't have my slides printed up in front of me, but I know it's on the next slide this time, so I'm feeling really like good with my transitions today. But how do we make this happen? And the answer is is library volunteers. Um, CSLP is a national nonprofit uh, made up of, of of library library staff, librarians, uh, state state uh, library workers from across the country. Um, and I'm got a slide here. And how we kind of organize ourselves in order to make this happen is we have a volunteer board of directors uh, comprised of folks from across the country. We have a lot, a lot of our work is done by committees and those are all volunteer uh, librarians, um, again, from across the country. The other kind of unique governing feature of CSLP is we have each state that participates in, in our organization has a state representative. And normally that is uh, your youth services consultant who works there at the state library. And all the decisions, so like above the little, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse cursor, so I'll just try to give you disc descriptions while I, uh, where I'm pointing. <laughs> I know you can't see my finger pointing at the screen, um, but above the kind of middle squiggly lines, that's, you know, that's really where all our leadership, it's all volunteers. Um, below that in the kind of midsection, our committees are also made up of library staff. Um, CSLP has a staff of two two full-time employees. Uh, we, we have a long-time person retiring this week, so we're, we're at three right now with Karen Day. But uh, if this slide, if you're viewing this presentation after uh, May 28th, uh, we, we have two staff folks. And we work with the artists and the suppliers and the designers and the vendors and, and everyone to try to make this, the program happen. Um, but all the ideas and everything like that comes from our, 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 our gracious and generous uh, librarian support from across the country. So what does this look like? How does CSLP kind of make an impact there? Um, essentially, we kind of create that sandbox or that toolkit or that the support materials that libraries at any level, you know, we try to support the, you know, maybe you have a, a 500 person children's department. I mean, that's super unlikely, but we would try to have materials to support you down to just the folks who it's just one person running a library. Maybe it's a volunteer library a library that's completely made up of volunteers. There's one or two staff folks. They're open just a handful of hours a week. We want to make sure that they have the things that they need uh, in order to have an engaging summer program where they can really kind of uh, bolster their community and really help support the uh, you know, children, adults, and teen, teens in their community. Um, so we develop a unified theme each year along with a slogan. So this summer is Imagine Your Story. 
Um, and boy, we have a lot of stories to imagine this summer. I don't think anyone could have imagined what this summer was going to look like back when we were planning, uh, certainly taking many different forms. Um, but, you know, we also kind of gather up artwork that, that we allow our member libraries to use to help, you know, kind of put a visual look out there to help kind of communicate what the library does and help shine some attention on, on the important work that they do. Uh, we also create, you know, a bunch of support products, and those are like bookmarks and reading logs, um, you know, little toy incentives, like anything you kind of need, any of those like little nuts and bolts materials that you need to run a successful program. And you can tell by these sort of different color font that the, the next one is super important too. We, we also create a programming manual every year. Um, it's really hard to try to come up with an image that, that, that is a, a good quick short visual shorthand for sort of a programming manual, but we try to have resources ideas, um, programming ideas, all the kinds of things, you know, book lists, all those sorts of things that you need to just sort of open up and, 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 and run your program. Um, and that includes sort of little printouts and, and things like that to help, uh, to help, uh, you know, to help you kind of uh, wrap your head around what you're going to do each summer. I mean, because like certainly we recognize like it's a huge, ta it's a monumental task to put on a program every summer. Um, and, and this summer they're needed more, more than ever for sure. So this year, gosh, and you know, like it's sort of heartbreaking, but 2020 Reimagined was just sort of a, a wonderful kind of take on the Imagine Your Story uh, slogan. But you know, certainly there are some things that are going to be different this year. You know, I, I talk to libraries from across the country every day, and a lot of folks are kind of struggling with what they're going to try to do, how they're going to implement. Um, I do think that we've kind of, I, I'm super pleased to report that it seems like most folks have kind of, you know, moved a little bit further in the grieving process of, of what their plans were going to look like for this summer and, and kind of adapted them from there. Um, so to kind of help support that work a little bit, you know, we, we put together kind of an ad hoc committee to kind of scramble to put together some resources. And one of the resources is 2020 uh, Reimagined. Um, it's got some good, I tried, I'm, I'm moving my mouse and pointing at my screen, but uh, you know, we've tried to put together some, some good, you know, almost kind of bullet point uh, inflection points so that, you know, it, it's super rough to have all your carefully laid plans just kind of scrapped out the window and have it be on your control. So I think that one of the, the things that's really good about the, the summer reimagine is it's important just to take a deep breath, take a step back. Things are going to be different this year and, and that's okay. And I think if, if that's sort of where you're starting from, you're going to have a successful program and success is going to look different this year. So we did create kind of a, a packet of, of materials with some sort of guidelines some ideas, there's some untested ideas, of course, we're, we're in a very unique situation, as well as just a, a, a bunch of handouts and things that you can readily put together and maybe share out. You know, we're trying to support your kind of online efforts, but recognize that even if it's not ideal, sometimes just, I know I've, I've got a, a, a 12 year old, you know, and it's nice to, it's comforting sometimes for children just to have some worksheets to go through. That's sort of part of their routine. And we wanted to make some of those uh, thematically appropriate materials available. Um, the other thing that we have, and particularly, you know, to kind of build on what Penny was saying, uh, Janet has been running our uh, Community and Child Wellbeing Committee, and they've done some awesome work to put together some quick and easy summer reading resources or summer, summer food resources for libraries to help kind of smooth that, you know, that onboarding or that on-ramp. And also just to, to, to let, you know, to provide libraries with the ideas that they need to kind of envision what a food service, being a food service site might look like at their library. So these beautiful purple arrows that came built into PowerPoint, I'm using to show you where these resources can be found, but just under on our homepage there, uh, summer reading resources, and it's the right here, the summer uh, libraries and summer food tab will take you to those resources. Um, and again, like it's tough to come up with, like I cannot emphasize, like I would super encourage you all if you haven't kind of poked around at these resources to make sure you do, but I just kind of put a list here, but you know, it's got some great uh, guide, guidance and also resources, um, you know, so, you know, just ways to plan, some planning tips, all those kinds of things are right there. Um, the other thing that we did this year is uh, working, you know, certainly with the committee, but also with the Library of Michigan to help get this put together. We created a, a, a guide um, to just help something libraries can share with their food sites that are off the library's uh, grant, you know, off the, 
the grounds of the library, but a, a way so that some of these other uh, remote sites or other places where children are gathering can help inject some literacy based activities or some reading materials um, and some programming ideas just to help kind of, you know, recognizing that See, food is certainly super important for young minds, but also those engaging activities are super important as well. So that was a, a project that we put together this summer to help. Uh, it was timely, uh, just in, in light of the circumstances there. Um, this uh, link will be available, but we also have an active Facebook group called Feeding the Whole Child, Libraries and Food, and I would encourage you all to join that. Um, sometimes it's wonderful just to hear some information from other folks. Uh, who are in kind of similar circumstances or to kind of troubleshoot or just hear some, uh, you know, some some stories that other folks have had or, or just to kind of, uh, I don't think there's too much griping and complaining, but sometimes that's nice to do in a Facebook group as well. <laughs> so I just wanted to thank you all. Um, that's sort of my presentation and, you know, feel free to reach out to me with any kind of questions you have about CSLP or, 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 or you know, I'd be happy to kind of help connect you with other folks as well. Um, so. I would just like to thank you and, and, and hand it back to Penny there. All right, well, we can open it up for some questions. I know uh, Janet and Melissa have been monitoring the chat, and I'm sure you've been answering some of those questions as well, but are you seeing any trends or themes that you think that we could uh, tackle? <laughs> Thank you, Penny. Thank you so much, Penny and Luke both. We have a handful of questions. Um, one of, I, well, actually, let me tell you a story first, because early in the session, uh, we got a story from Anna at the McHenry Public Library in McHenry, Illinois, who says that they've been doing summer food service program as well as the regular school year program for a few years now. She says their stats were about five times their regular turnout last April during their emergency food service program, and that they're anticipating oh. equally high numbers this summer and are excited to help their kids in need. So thank you so much, Anna, and thank you for sharing that story. It, I, I just. I'm going to just say very briefly that, and I know that all of our panelists and all of our participants who do library service and have been thinking about or doing food service, I probably feel this also. There's such a kind of happy sadness to knowing that you're serving a lot of kids because it means that there are a lot of kids to serve. And in a just world, you wouldn't have to be doing this to begin with. But that's it. That that's a beautiful story. And thank you. We have an interesting, uh, possibly technical question from Shane about the COVID waivers and particularly about the waiver regarding area eligibility. And Penny had mentioned that under ordinary circumstances, in order to be an open SFSP site, you need to be located where at least 50% of your children are eligible for free or reduced price meals and that that is waived this summer. Shane wants to know whether the free and reduced price numbers used to decide eligibility under waivers are decided by the waiver at your level, at USDA level, or, are, or is it decided by the state after they receive the waiver? Like how, who, at what, at what place is it decided that the location has to be 40% eligible or 30% eligible. Is that national or is that by state? Majed, why don't you take it? Sure. Um, the, uh, the eligibility determinations are, are, are made locally by, by school districts and, and locally. However, uh, operating under, under nationwide waivers allowed us to, to, um, uh, to provide flexibilities with respect to um, Area eligibility. So areas that were not uh, able to participate in the past uh, are able now to participate. So I just want to make a, a, a distinction between nationwide waivers, which really allows uh, states uh, to um, to waive uh, area eligibility requirements. Uh, if that expires, um, uh, states actually have the ability to request statewide waivers, depending on the situation. So that's another line of, of, of defense, just in case. We do not really know yet the, the, the status, uh, the future on, way, on nationwide waivers, but uh, states still have the ability to request statewide waivers to have a continuation depending on, uh, uh, on the situation in, 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 in states and localities. 
right? So to piggyback on that, your best bet really is to um, go to the website and find the uh, State Department of Education or Department of Health, whomever is the contact for your state, and inquire with them, and then they can tell you whether your area uh, is eligible this summer. And then a follow-up, thank you very much, um, both in Shed mm -hmm. and um, Penny. A follow-up question from Shane also. If, if a librarian or a, just an individual, if a citizen wants to, um, you know, wants to make the case that their area should be eligible for summer food service program, at what point, at what place should they lobby? Should they talk to the state agency to try to make the case at that point, or is that something to go to the federal level? Um, I think the um, uh, biggest amount of help could come directly from the state agency if they are contacted. They have access to a lot of information, and they have access to us at the federal level at all times. So there, there is um, a lot of um, flexibilities that, um, uh, and they have authorities to do certain things. So yes, a good place to go to will be to the state agency, to the state agency, and then they'll be able to direct you from there. Right. And this is a federal program. You can always go to your congressional representatives and let them know how you feel um, and advocate for uh, whatever it is. And they will call us and they will let us know that you have uh, questions, comments, and some challenges. And, uh, and that's important. It's important that your voice is heard. I mean, they're your tax dollars that are being spent and um, it's important that you advocate. So certainly let your congressional representatives know they call us a lot. So <laughs> they're listening. There's another question. Uh, Tara wants to know, can we hand out census materials when we give out summer lunches? Um, I don't, I don't know. Um, if there is a coordination, uh, sometimes federal agencies come together and coordinate activities. If there is any local coordination between between federal authorities, uh, whether uh, census bureau or uh, or another agency, there is nothing really wrong with that, and it, it is allowable. Um, but uh, there isn't really any nationwide instructions on that. But if you see an example, once you know it's a federal agency involved in this then it's okay to join hands with them. Penny, you had mentioned the after-school snack program. I don't know, you didn't prepare to talk about after-school snacks today. You prepared to talk about summer food service program, but if you can, would you describe for in just real brief terms what that program is and whether libraries would also be eligible to serve as sites in a similar way as they would for the summer food service program? So, Michelle, I have a feeling yeah. that falls into your category, which yeah. is child and adult care feeding program. Sure. Um, well, um, under normal operations, uh, schools uh, serve, serve snacks under the National School Lunch Program. Uh, what we have seen now with the uh, with the nationwide waivers and the flexibilities during uh, during uh, the national emergency, we have seen situations where where meal delivery and pickup and and all arrangements have been done in such ways that we have never seen in in the past. So there, I could see a scenario where where, for example, a, a, a library can coordinate with a school with a local school to be a distribution center, for example, or a pickup location. So we, uh, we have been approving and states have been approving a lot of flexibilities. And what's important here, like I know Penny mentioned earlier, um, if you are uh, facing a tricky situation and you want to make sure the meals are being served uh, safely for children, make sure you engage and you involve the, the local health authorities because it really is, during an emergency, uh, you, you want to make sure you have the maximum flexibility, but you also want to make sure the meals are safe. So to ensure safety, we, we urge you to make sure you consult routinely with local health authorities. Thank you. We have a question from Beth. 
And she wants to know what the cutoff date is to become a summer food service program site this year and whether that cutoff date has been extended due to all the extenuating circumstances. Um, yes, actually, it used to be uh, historically uh, June 30th, but that has been, uh, I think it's included in one of the nationwide waivers. It has given uh, one of those waivers extended uh, the deadline, and it is really, uh, I don't know what it is right now, but it's definitely extended beyond uh, beyond the, uh, the normal time. There is time right now. Contact your state agency and work with them closely and other partners and see what you can do. There is plenty of time still. And if I could piggyback on that, um, one of the things I didn't talk about earlier is that you don't have to run a program the whole entire summer. You don't have, there's no cap, like you don't have to, or minimum, so say you wanna open for two weeks because you have a two week program, you can actually be a site for the two weeks. You can run on a Saturday, you can run on a Sunday. Um, there's a limit about like how many meals you can serve per day, I believe. I don't think that got waived, maybe it did. But um, you, uh, you're not limited to, or have a minimum amount of times. So you could have like just a one day event and you could probably be approved for a summer, summer meal. You could run all summer. You could be a summer meal site too. Thank you, Penny. And thank you, Mashed. So there's plenty of flexibility. So if a library wanted to to have a summer food service program distribution in conjunction with its summer library program, and that program ran from say June 30th through July 31st only, or if it ran from June 1st through August 30th, yes, either way they could incorporate meals or snacks into it. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. And I just also want to emphasize something um, Penny mentioned earlier. Um, uh, the summer program was intended to obviously provide meals during the summer months, but the, uh, the provision, and thank God for that provision that allowed uh, 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 summer meals to be served outside summer months. And that's what we call unanticipated school closure. So whenever there is a declaration or, or the status is un uh, unanticipated school closure, then we all have the ability, uh, depending on, 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 <clears throat> on the status locally, to, to go ahead and begin uh, uh, serving summer meals again during non-summer months. And this has been, as you can imagine, uh, has been critical uh, nationwide during uh, right from the start of, of, of the COVID-19 crisis because it, it was nationwide school closures and the program was was being used in, in nationwide in all states by all schools. And I just want, want you to know, and again, you could still have a situation where we may um, go through the summer months and then as school, as school starts again, you could have a situation where there may be school closures again. So um, I just want you to be aware uh, that you have the ability, if you are a summer site at the library and you have a situation where you are in, in a school closure, you can serve summer meals in, in, at the start of winter months or whenever the time is. And uh, there are a great deal of flexibilities uh, uh, that come with unanticipated with the implementation of unanticipated school closure summer summer meals, and you can work closely with your state agency and with your school district too, because a lot of times schools are are involved in in in, uh, in meal distribution, and you will be involved, and they, they, that can take a lot of local coordination between you and the school districts and and all local authorities. It could be between you the fire department, the police department, the school district. So if, if your ability to all come together in the community is extremely uh, important. And you, uh, as the library, uh, that's a huge uh, uh, part of the community. Um, and, and you'll be coordinating with others to just make things happen and get sick meals out. Debbie has a comment. Um, that's exactly what we're doing in Delaware, partnering with a school district to be a distribution site three days a week. 
Nice. That's wonderful. Thanks, Debbie. Great and job. We've got a, Great job. <laughs> we've got a question from David. It says, hi, I noticed the site locator map showed no sites for New Hampshire where I am. Why is that? Thanks. Um, I well, don't specifically know. It's possible that nobody, maybe it doesn't qualify, or maybe nobody stepped up to the plate yet, or, or it could be that the state hasn't provided us the data yet to yeah. tell us where those summer sites are. It is May the 28th. School in New Hampshire runs through the end of June. So it's very possible, um, like Majed said, historically the states uh, have an opening until the June 15th, June 30th to send in applications. It's possible that they haven't given us the data yet. That happens with some of our New England states. I know that because I used to live there. Um, so that could be it. Majed, anything else you wanna? Yes, actually under normal circumstances, one of the most important things for all of us is to detect underserved areas. And a way to detect uh, or to identify underserved areas will be just like what, what, uh, uh, what was said, you go into the, into the mapping tool and you find out the whole area that is not, there's no coverage at all. Uh, then you need, uh, uh, there is potential uh, uh, need there and there is, uh, and, the, and that need is not being met. So the state agency usually has the ability to work with local sponsors to, to have coverage for that underserved area. So yes, it is important, and and I would point this out to the state agency, because they have the ability to coordinate uh, uh, where sites are open and coordinate. Like in some cases, actually, we may have more than what we need in certain locations. That states has has a way of coordinating that and spread sites out a little bit. Thank you. Sure. Nancy asks, actually, let me, let me share a comment that Shane shared a few minutes ago. He says, libraries can seek out partners in the community to act as sites as well. You are rooted in your community. If the library isn't the right place, go out into your community and find someone in a better situation. Bring people together. He says, I've been in two of those meetings this week for different areas. It's amazing what can happen when you bring people together. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Such a good example. And we have, I believe, one last question. This is from Nancy, who um, mentions brochures from USDA um, from a lunch at the library workshop. She says they are very colorful and good. Titles include Move In With Summer Meals, Eat Smart To Play Hard, Summer Meal, Summer Fun. And she wants to know if there's anything similar that's available specifically this year for the summer lunch program. I haven't seen anything yet. Have you, Michelle? Uh, not yet, but uh, a lot of times uh, there, there is new material and we try to share it with our state agencies and even electronically the minute it, it becomes available. So stay tuned and, and keep checking the websites uh, and the material and the resources that Penny and, and Janet, uh, uh, Melissa shared and Luke shared as well. And there is always new new material out there for all of you. Thank you very much. Everybody who's on the line right now, if you have a question that comes up later or if you're listening to this as a recording at a later date, um, know that all of the panelists are completely available to you, so feel free to contact us with your questions at any time. I'll pass this back to Penny to finish us up. Thank you. Great. Well, um, this is wonderful. You guys have some really good questions. Thank you for your comments, for your stories. Thank you to those that have already participated in summer meals and those of you that might be interested in participating this year. And again, like if this isn't your thing, if it's not something that your library can do, maybe you don't have programming this summer or you just don't feel comfortable working with uh, summer meals, um, uh, do as our, our friend said, you know, and reach out and figure out who you can partner with and who can advocate. You can certainly advocate for the families, but who you can work with. Um, again, if you have suggestions or comments, reach out to your congressional folks because that's how we make change. Um, they certainly reach out to us when they've got questions. Um, and um, please, uh, 
reach out to us if you have questions. Um, your state agency um, is the best person to talk to. Look for a sponsor and hook up with them and figure out how they can prepare the meals and deliver them to you. And then um, keep on doing all of the amazing community work that you guys do. I'm so, so excited that um, this partnership continues. Uh, Janet uh, reached out to us several years ago, so this is not the first webinar that we've done together, um, but it certainly is our most unique. That is for sure. So uh, thank you to Luke, okay. thank you to Ready? Janet and um, Melissa for all of your tech, um, she's our tech guru, and Majed, of course, for all of your technical knowledge. Um, and, and thank you to everyone hey, out there. Um, anyone else have anything else they need to say before we wrap it up? There is a question that came through. So speaking oh, okay. back to uh, admin agencies, uh, Christina says, why would a state not have a state SSSP admin agency? None is listed for Idaho. Um, and let, and I'm sorry, this is Janet. Let me... Um, um, add that we're, there was another question from a librarian in Maine, and we did mm -hmm. determine that their Department of Education is the SFSP admin agency. So it may be that the that the um, directory on the USDA website just needs to be updated. But yeah. I, so right. I just wanted to mention that Maine and Idaho seem to be both um, needing to be updated. Okay, so we need to update that. Idaho State Department of Education, according to a Google search, uh, does oversee SFSP. Um, you, can, you guys can always uh, email me if you have questions. I'm at penny.weaver at usda.gov, and I'd be more than happy to point you in the right direction. If something does look wrong on our website, I can make sure that it gets to the right um, people to um, so we make those changes on the website. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your editing eyes. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. I appreciate it. Everyone stay safe. Wash your hands. Wear your masks. <laughs> Have a great summer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. All right.